An amazing and maybe not surprising tale. We'll tell you in a minute. But first, the avalanche of propaganda continues here. You can tell when the Democratic Party's PR apparatus believes it has come up with an especially effective talking point because suddenly you hear the exact same phrase from the lips of every media savvy congressman and cable news hack on television, including on this show. The latest, you might have noticed, we certainly have, is opposition research. That's what Democrats are now calling the Trump dossier, that collection of lurid, unverified allegations that in some cases appears to have come straight from the Kremlin. Last month, Democrats told us that dossier was evidence of treason. It was grounds for impeachment. Well, now that it turns out that Hillary and the DNC paid for it, the whole thing is being written off as merely opposition research. Totally routine, no big deal, move along, nothing to see here. Come on, why are you so uptight? We've heard the story a thousand times. Right, not so fast. In fact, the Trump dossier is far from just opposition research. For almost a year, it has been the linchpin in a remarkable effort to overturn last year's election results. Information in that dossier, which in retrospect looks frankly very much like disinformation, flowed from Russia to the Hillary Clinton campaign and the headquarters of the Democratic Party. From there, it somehow made its way throughout the Obama administration to the FBI and various other law enforcement agencies and intel agencies as well. The Obama administration used the dossier's allegations to justify spying efforts against American citizens, including Trump associates. In other words, the entire investigation into Russia and Russia collusion, the one that has stalled our government and changed our foreign policy, all of it grows from the now discredited Trump dossier. It's hardly just a piece of opposition research. It's a history-changing document and apparently a fraudulent one. So it's no wonder so many people are now lying about it. Maggie Haberman and Ken Vogel, the New York Times report, that Democratic officials repeatedly lied to them for more than a year, claiming they had nothing to do with the dossier. Neither the Hillary Clinton campaign nor the DNC reported their payments to the firm that compiled it as they were required to do by law. And the lying continues to this moment. According to new reports today, both Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta and ex-DNC chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz just last month told the Senate Intel Committee behind closed doors they had no idea who funded the dossier. They didn't know of any contractual relationship between the organizations they ran and Fusion GPS, the firm that put it together. Right. Not likely, actually. The DNC and the Clinton campaign combined paid more than $9 million to the law firm Perkins Cole for legal services, and it seems likely that Fusion was receiving the lion's share of that. We can't tell you exactly how much they were receiving because Fusion GPS has resisted congressional subpoenas of its financial records. Still, it seems almost certain to be a massive payoff, multi-millions of dollars. Were Wasserman Schultz and Podesta both so detached from the campaigns they were running in a presidential year that they had no idea where millions of dollars went? That seems absurd. Meanwhile, less than an hour ago, as we told you just at the top of this, another great mystery has been solved. The identity of the funder of the original Fusion GPS opposition research on the Trump campaign. Now, we've known for a long time it was an anti-Trump Republican. Now, according to a report by the Washington Examiner's Byron York, we know it was the Washington Free Beacon. That's a website funded by hedge fund billionaire Paul Singer and founded in part by Twitter celebrity Bill Kristol. That's where it all began. And we can promise you that not a single person in Washington is surprised by that. David DeFerry is a former State Department official. He advised the Obama campaign on foreign policy and he joins us tonight. David, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're here because we've had many conversations about Russia over the past year, you and I, and you've expressed outrage at the collusion between the Trump people and Russia. Now that we know that the Hillary campaign colluded with Russia, took information from Russia to affect the outcome of the campaign, are you as outraged? First of all, I never expressed outrage that there was collusion. I expressed outrage that, this, that Russia interfered in our election, which all of our intelligence agencies agree to and I said that needs to be investigated and if there is collusion that's a very serious crime okay, by so, the Trump campaign. So we know that the Russians gave information through a couple of cutouts to the Hillary campaign and the Democratic National Committee to influence the election. So how is that different from what you just said? That's not what happened. Oh, how is that? The, what the news that we learned this week is that Hillary Clinton funded Fusion GPS but we already knew that a 
Democratic ally had funded it. That came out in October 2016. If you look at the Mother Jones article, which first published these allegations, we didn't know, we didn't know, it was clear then know that, that a Democratic ally had funded this. So we just now know which ally, okay. and it was a Hillary Clinton campaign. But what you're doing is tracing the genesis of the story. I'm asking you a factual question about what happened. Russia gave information to Steele, the former MI, head of the Russia desk at MI6, who gave it to Fusion GPS, and then it flowed to the Hillary Clinton campaign and the DNC to influence the outcome of the election. So information from Russia was used to influence the outcome using Hillary as a conduit. And I'm just wondering, where's your outrage about that? That's not accurate. Well, how is that Steel, inaccurate exactly? Steele was hired to do opposition research. And as part of the opposition research, he talked to lots of people, not just Russians. He talked to people in Europe. He talked to people in the well, US. I'm, I'm certain he, he found did. sources, which is what but hold on, good intelligence you, agents do. So, and so some of his sources were Russian. Did? No, some of his sources were Russian sources. Okay, but I didn't say every, no, but you're, you, <laughs> I didn't say every source was Russian. I'm merely saying what we know from the public record and what the committee is in the process of learning is an information from the Russians and that would be people associated with the Kremlin the Russian government found its way to the Clinton campaign they paid for that information and it was designed to influence the outcome of the election so I, I look I'm just holding you to the standard that you set when you said this is undermining American democracy this is hacking of an election why is it not the case here everyone should read the Steele dossier and you will see there were many sources in the Steele okay, dossier but, but that was one of not not just Russians. Well, but, yes, some but I'm Russians. not saying that it Correct. was the only one. I'm but also people saying. like Carter Page, who worked for Trump, was I got a source. It. I got it. His lawyer Cohen was a source. you're obscuring the point. And I think, our, I think our viewers know that you're obscuring the point. And I think that you know that you're obscuring the point. Look, if it's wrong for one side to do it, it is wrong for any side to do it. You have evidence here that it happened on the Democratic side. There is no evidence that the Republican side did it. If there is, I will denounce it along with you. You're equating two things that are not equal. It is not wrong for opposition research to be conducted and for some of the sources to be Russian to be the especially Russian government if the, so it's not the, you don't have a problem the with suspic that. suspicion is that Trump engaged in collusion with the Russians now let's remember one well, important wait a second wait a second Hold tell on. me no just really quick Let me why, real why did Hillary not engage I mean it's an honest question why given what we know now that apparently the Hillary campaign, the DNC working for the Hillary campaign, gave millions of dollars to get information from the Russians. How are they not colluding with the Russians? I'm missing this. I'm slow. There's, there's nothing. There's no news that suggests they gave money to the Russians. They gave money to a British former intelligence agent who went around and collected information and paid money from to Russians. The Russians. We don't know that yet. Well, we I don't know we... what he did. But now, but let me make one important point. Okay? You don't seem that why do we? Out, why do we you? have a special counsel investigation? We have a special counsel investigation because. Trump fired the FBI director Comey. He fired the FBI director Comey because he was so worried about these allegations. I think you're missing a few steps, and you're, you, here's a step, the key step you're missing, is that the investigation already begun. The Justice Department began investigating Correct. the ties between the Trump but campaign and But we got a and, special oh, counsel on. investigation Why did they do when that? Trump I, fired I, I Comey, got, correct? I, I've been here the whole time, but the the Ur investigation was underway, and it was underway in part because of material gleaned from the Trump dossier paid for by the Hillary campaign. It's a really simple question. Well, Does it bother no, you? You're, you're wrong. I'm not. I'm there actually, were lots of reasons why no, the FBI started I investing. I said in part. Including, including they had surveillance. They, they've said this. They had surveillance of okay, Trump David, David, campaign I, officials talking to Russians. I, I got that's it. Also Does it why, bother you? But that's also why they opened an investigation. They didn't just open you an investigation. You can't have a conversation with someone who's shouting. So okay. I'm going to lower my voice. I hope you'll do the same. We know because it has been publicly reported that the head of the FBI, Jim Comey, tried to add the Trump dossier to the J January intel report from the intelligence community showing that Russia interfered in our election. So this report played a pivotal role in the investigations we're now living through. And I'm asking you a simple question. Does it bother you that a campaign document, opposition research, wound up circulating through the Obama administration, through law enforcement and intelligence agencies? How the hell did that happen? But Tucker, you're trying to argue that all I'm roads, arguing, I'm all roads lead back to the Steele dossier, and that's not I'm correct. You, For instance, the January you? intelligence report that came from our CIA, our FBI, okay. from our State Department, that was based Just on their review of, of what happened Here's in what, our campaign and their review of the data and the stealing of data what? from the you, DNC. You emails. and so th that, the lunatic congressman we had on last night have are, convinced me you guys know that there's no answer to these questions, and so you're filibustering. That's that's why we have a special a counsel. Okay. The special counsel will find the Ooh, answers. And this, you should support that. This is hurting. This is really hurting. You just proved that because you're a reasonable guy, but you're acting in an unreasonable manner, which suggests that you know this is bad. It's bad.
that, David? We're going to find out. Thank you. Thanks, Tucker. Jonathan Turley is a law professor at George Washington University Law School. A cool head, not a right winger. Been around a long time. And I wanted you to come on to assess coolly, logically, the legal exposure potentially from this story. Well, there's considerable exposure. You know, the interesting thing about the original Russian collusion argument is that colluding with Russians is not a crime under the right. criminal code. There's no such crime. There's conspiracy, but the question is conspiracy to do what? The case, I, I've been saying this, many people have been saying this, for actual crime is actually getting weaker by the day. There's really not much evidence to suggest an actual federal crime. You know, you compare it to this, there is a basis for a criminal charge if these allegations pr are proven. Now, you have the Uranium One deal, which right. is a pay-for-play allegation. That's a serious crime. The Clintons could very well show that there was no relationship between the half a million dollars that went to Bill Clinton and what the Senate, what the, the State Department did. But that is a classic criminal allegation if it were to be proven. With regard to the Fusion GPS and the dossier, um, there are issues there, particularly if people lie to investigators. Uh, either congressional or federal, that's the type of crime that gets charged in D.C. It's not... So the very specific... I think what you're referring to is what apparently happened last month before right. the Senate uh, committee investigating this, where John Podesta, the former chairman of Hillary's campaign, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the former head of the Democratic Party, were asked directly, did you pay for this? Did you... Did money from your coffers wind up at Fusion GPS? And both said no. That's right. And one of the people in the most precarious position is this attorney, Mark Elias, who... Right. Uh, who who um, was the general counsel of the campaign. The New York Times reporters, two of them, have accused him of expressly saying there was no relationship at all with the Clinton campaign or the DNC and the dossier. He was also sitting next to John Podesta with congressional investigators when Podesta made the same denial. And that gets you into very difficult area of what's called 18 U.S.C. 1001. That's when false statements are given to federal investigators. And that has to be a concern. doesn't mean that uh, that crime occurred. But it's an obvious concern. Can you think of an alternative explanation? I mean, it's. I, I will just take off the table the idea that the head of the campaign and the head of the party didn't know about millions being spent on opposition research. That's not a credible claim. Is there some other way they could explain their behavior before that committee? Well, that's what the, the investigators really have to look at. I mean, it's hard to argue that this isn't appropriate for investigation. There's serious questions here. It doesn't mean there's crimes, but there's serious questions. And it's it's also true that, you know, if you're investigating the, the Trump side for coordinating or colluding with Russians, this would seem to be an analogous situation. Now, having said that, the moral high ground in Washington has always been measured in millimeters. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm not too sure I'm going to cast aspersions or congratulations on either side. But there, that's always a safe bet. But yeah. So, but there there are serious criminal allegations here that that could potentially be moved on. So I think that both sides need to acknowledge that many people felt that after Comey was fired, there was a legitimate basis for the special counsel investigation. It's hard to deny that there's legitimate basis for the congressional investigation into Uranium One, into the dossier, uh, to find out what these facts are. And if people lied in the course of that, that's the type of crime people get indicted for in Washington. So um, the neocons in D.C. hated Trump. And so apparently a bunch of them got together and funded this opposition research that became the Trump dossier, the Washington Free Beacon, and uh, all the people associated with it. Is, is there any legal questions around that? Well, frankly, I don't see the crime in gathering evidence, even from foreign sources, right. any more than I did with Trump and the allegations on that side. Where you get into some serious problems is if you're trying to acquire classified information or if you are encouraging the theft of information or the hacking of systems. Right. Those can be charged as a, as, as a crime. But in terms of gathering information, as you know, that's a long standing sure. practice in Washington, D.C. Sounds right to me. But what you really have to look for are people that may have given false information on investigations. And that's what prosecutors start with because those are people that can be easily charged. Right. This is how Martha Stewart wound up in federal prison. <laughs> Jonathan Trilly, thank you. Thanks, Doctor. Peter Schweitzer literally wrote the book. On Uranium One, Clinton Cash, that began all of this. He joins us tonight. Peter, thanks for coming on. Um, so there, there's thanks, actually Tucker. a new development in what is basically an old story. Tell us what it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, the new development is that Hillary Clinton's defense uh, in saying that she was not involved in the Uranium One decision has essentially been they trotted out a uh, former Assistant Secretary of State uh, Fernandez to say that he was the one that made the decision, and they presented him as basically a a you know serious uh, arbitrator who is going to explain how this was done. Uh, the problem is uh, that if you look at the John Podesta emails that were leaked, you find something very curious, Tucker. You find that Mr. Fernandez was communicating with Mr. Podesta when this story first broke in 2015 when my book came out. And in fact, what Mr. Fernandez told John Podesta was, I want to do all I can to help the Hillary Clinton campaign. And literally four days after that email, that's when he was trotted out to say Hillary Clinton was not involved in this decision. I was the one that made the decision to approve the Uranium One deal. So what it means, bottom line, is you know this is not a source we can trust. It's, it's another example of why we need to investigate this. Uh, we simply can't take his word for it, and we certainly can't take Hillary Clinton's word for it. Well, it also suggests that they knew exactly how this would be perceived from the outside. So her right. husband had taken this half a million dollar speaking fee, their family foundation had taken about 145 million from board members of Uranium One. There are gonna be a lot of questions, and so it sounds like from the evidence you just suggested that they found this guy and said, you know what, you're making the decision. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, their responses have been to trot out Fernandez, and their other defense has essentially been, well, there were eight other government agencies that approved this deal. The problem is, Tucker, that has absolutely nothing to do with the issue of bribery. Uh, there's right. nothing in the bribery statutes that says you have to be the swing vote. <laughs> uh, the point is, is if that she voted and supported this initiative in any way uh, in exchange for this money, it doesn't matter if the vote was five to four, if nine to zero, it still comes constitutes bribery. So, you know, this is part of the problem. They have not presented any evidence to support their claims, and I think it's why we need to investigate this. We can't take Hillary's word for it, and the explanations they've offered thus far uh, simply don't add up. That's right. And not all government agencies are created equal. I mean, the State Department is the first among equals, so, you know, they have more influence than others. Of course, this whole thing in American national security suffered because of this. Anyway, Peter, thank you. You're the one who broke this story, and I don't think you can get enough credit for it. I appreciate it. Thanks, Doctor. The latest JFK documents have been out for 24 hours. They've revealed some things that people didn't know before. We'll bat it around with a JFK expert next. Almost 3,000 documents related to the Kennedy assassination were released last night. Some were deliberately withheld yet again 54 years later as the CIA and other unnamed agencies seek redactions because you're not allowed to see it. In other words, it's enough fuel for conspiracy theorists to go another 50 years or so. What have we learned in the last 24 hours? Larry Sabato is a professor at the University of Virginia. He runs the Center for Politics. He's an expert on Kennedy and the assassination. He joins us tonight. So, uh, Larry, whenever you talk about this, you know, you don't want to seem like a nutcase or anything. On the other hand, Bobby Kennedy, the then Attorney General, it has now been shown, believed his first reaction was the CIA did this. I'm not saying they did, but I am saying, you know, he thought it was possible. Um, so have we gotten any closer to what happened with these documents? No, uh, at least not the ones I've read, Tucker. Remember, there right. are tens and tens of thousands of pages. We're just now uh, skimming them uh, and using some great student resources. I think you know how good the students are at the University yes, of Virginia. I do. You know some of them. Uh, so we're, we're looking for new material. We found some nuggets that are very, very interesting, but I don't think it's changing the course of history. It isn't rewriting the Warren Commission. It isn't uh, changing the general thrust of the evaluation evaluation of this assassination over many, many years. Well, so what have we learned? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, I've tried to understand Lee Harvey Oswald. I've, I've right. read a great deal about him. You know, he was, he was young, he was a misfit, some might say a sociopath, very strange guy. Who would defect to the Soviet Union That's right. in those days from the United States? And then he got to come back, amazingly, went right to work really for Fidel Castro. Uh, so this is an unusual fellow. But 
One thing I never understood was that, until I read something in that file, he had murder on his mind for a long time. Uh, one of his associates uh, in the military reported uh, shortly after Eisenhower began his second term that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald said he wanted to kill uh, Dwight Eisenhower because he was part of the oppressive class, uh, killing the, the poor people. We, we know uh, as well that uh, during his, uh, when he came back to the United States, uh, he told his wife and convinced her at one point that he was preparing to kill former Vice President Richard Nixon uh, on a Texas trip. Yes, on a Texas trip. Uh, it turned out he was, use, he was using that to abuse his wife, Tucker. Uh, the, the Vice President wasn't coming at the time that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald told his wife he was. He never had the opportunity. Then he nearly killed General Edward when Walker, it was an yes. inch difference. He shot at him, nearly killed him. We know what happened on November 22nd. This guy had murder on his mind well, for me, years, and he finally acted on it. Let me ask you quickly. There's there's evidence that a British newspaper, or, or the FBI anyway, believed that a British newspaper received a call less than an hour before the assassination saying, call the U.S. Embassy, something terrible is about to happen in America. Is, is, there any, is that a credible account, do you think? Yes, it is. In fact, uh, today I had a lot of experiences with British TV. They were fascinated with this document. They were focusing on it. Uh, what convinced me was not simply the account by the reporter. It was that we've now learned MI5, British intelligence, yes. uh, essentially validated this claim and believed the reporter did pretty extensive research into it. They were never able to identify the person who made the call, but 25 minutes before President Kennedy was assassinated. This reporter in the Cambridge News, remember Cambridge was a nest of communist spies of for decades. And uh, they know 25 minutes before this person said to the reporter, you'd better call the U.S. Embassy. There's big news coming out That's of the amazing. United States. Now look, maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it was a crank call, but I'll tell you, it's one of the most incredible coincidences in history. It's unbelievable. Larry Sabato, that was really interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you, Tucker. Thanks a lot. Hollywood attorney Lisa Bloom made her career acting as the supposed champion of victims of sexism. But that's not at all what she was. Tonight, additional evidence she worked to discredit victims of sexual harassment, specifically those harassed by Harvey Weinstein. She did it for pay. We've got details next. that a Hollywood ambulance chaser and fake feminist Lisa Bloom worked to discredit, discredit numerous women who claim sexual harassment at the hands of Harvey Weinstein. Trace Gallagher is in Los Angeles and has the details of this amazing story. Hey, Trace. Hey, Tucker. Critics have called Lisa Bloom a mercenary scavenger who spent decades posing as an advocate for vulnerable women exploited by the powerful. Her decision to defend the very powerful Harvey Weinstein raised eyebrows, including her mother's, Gloria Allred, who condemned the arrangement. But now we know Bloom wasn't just defending Weinstein. She reportedly was willing to ruin his accusers in the process. The Daily Beast is reporting that earlier this year, Lisa Bloom called Ronan Farrow, who was in the middle of his Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein investigation and offered to share opposition re opposition research on the sexual history of Weinstein accuser Rose McGowan. And the Daily Mail says at the time, Bloom did not disclose that she was defending Weinstein. Other reports say Bloom also investigated compromising information on an Italian model who not only accused Weinstein of assault, but helped New York police get an audio tape of Weinstein admitting assault. Speaking of audio, TMZ says Bloom also tried to secretly record at least one of Weinstein's alleged victims. Bloom says she resigned from representing Weinstein after learning of his sexual misdeeds and cannot comment further, citing attorney-client privilege. Tucker. What a shame, Trace. It would be great to know more. Thank you for that. We're joined now by our old friend, Fox Chief Washington Correspondent James Rosen, who's got some information on the very real effect of sanctuary cities, those that are refusing to cooperate uh, to enforce immigration laws. James? Tucker, good evening. Two of America's biggest so-called sanctuary cities are tonight defying pressure from the Justice Department to begin cooperating with federal immigration authorities. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney informed DOJ today they have no intention of providing information by Sunday's imposed deadline 
to prove they are not impeding federal immigration enforcement. Justice has threatened both cities with a cutoff of millions in federal grants. Officials with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, say the enforcement posture of sanctuary cities is indeed endangering citizens in those communities, and they point to several recent examples. In late August, Neri Israel Estrada Margo, a 38-year-old undocumented immigrant from Guatemala, reportedly turned himself in to local authorities in Sonoma County, California, after he allegedly beat his girlfriend to death. Margos now faces murder charges. The same man had been jailed for beating the same woman all of two weeks earlier. ICE said Sonoma County gave federal agents 16 minutes notice before setting the man free. And then there is the case of Mario Granados Alvarado, a 19-year-old undocumented immigrant from El Salvador with multiple arrests. ICE officials say Granados Alvarado in April broke into an unmarked police car in Montgomery County, Maryland, and stole an AR-15 rifle and ammunition. He was arrested within days. ICE filed a detainer, but Montgomery County reportedly let the man walk after he posted $2,000 bond. He was later arrested, Tucker, by ICE agents again. It's amazing. It's amazing to see the details of this. Normally, we speak only in terms of broad slogans. Thank you, James, for that. You bet. Fascinating. Nicole Maliotakis is the Republican who is challenging Bill de Blasio in the mayor's race this year. She says in the past four years, Mayor de Blasio has effectively put the city up for sale. Nicole Maliotakis joins us tonight. Nicole, thanks all for coming on. Thank you. So can you be more specific in your allegations against Mayor de Blasio? Well, if you read the headlines of the New York Post and the Daily News today, uh, it is said that during testimony with a related, cor unrelated corruption trial, that one of the those who testified is a donor of Bill de Blasio says that he bought the mayor for $189,000 and that he had the mayor whenever he wanted his attention, whenever he needed assistance, uh, and he got special treatment out of City Hall. And this is not the first time we're hearing about something like this. Uh, we see here in New York City where property is being leased off to developers who are building luxury condos and those developers have either bundled uh, tens of thousands of dollars for the mayor or their lobbyists who have bundled tens of thousands of dollars for the mayor and have also seen projects such as a deed, a deed restriction lifted from a health care facility in Lower East Side of Manhattan. None of that is surprising to people familiar with New York, but it's upsetting uh, nonetheless. I wonder, I've worked in, around, in New York on and off for many years, and I wonder if you've noticed what I have, which is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people living on the street in New York, more people living on the street than I've ever seen in decades. Is this partly due to the mayor's policies? I didn't notice this before, and what would you do about it? It, it is partly due to his policies, uh, diminishing policies that were put in place by the previous previous mayors, uh, the mayor has basically ignored the city of New York. And we have seen a decline in the quality of life with homelessness, with a transit crisis. Uh, the mayor is out campaigning with uh, Elizabeth Warren. He has Bernie Sanders coming to town on Monday. He clearly has an agenda to run nationally uh, for president of the United States. And at the same time, the people of New York City are suffering. And my plans to tackle homelessness and mental illness are on my website at www.nm26 about the issues that are plaguing this city. The people of New York deserve better. We are being asked to shell out a tremendous amount of money in taxes, property taxes in particular. Even he's benefiting from the system here in New York, where yeah, his noticed. district pays the least effective uh, property tax rate. So he and his millionaire friends and donors are getting a lot in terms of uh, benefits, and the people of New York City continue to struggle paying more taxes and not getting results. I, here's my confusion quickly, is that private sector businesses in New York despise de Blasio, he despises them. Are they behind you completely? They seem very passive in the face of de Blasio, like there's really nothing we can do. Have they swung behind your campaign to unseat this guy? We're getting a lot of support and every day, uh, the, the more he opens his mouth uh, and revelations like pay to play come. We are getting more support from around the country. We can defeat Bill de Blasio November 7th. We need the help from around the country to stop his national agenda, which is very dangerous to our city and the nation yeah. as well. It seems that I, well, I hate to say I don't be partisan. I agree with you, Nicole. Thanks for coming on tonight. Thank Good you. To see you. Well, an FBI agent infiltrated terror groups over a period of years. They believed he was one of them. An amazing life in the shadows. He joins us next to tell us what he saw.
Bernie spent years helping the FBI combat Islamic terrorism, and he did it in the most daring and dangerous way possible by personally joining their ranks as an inside man. The work was so dangerous that Tamer El Nuri is not his real name. We can't let you hear his real voice. We can't let you know what he looks like, in fact. El Nuri just put out a new book. It's called American Radical, Inside the World of an Undercover Muslim FBI Agent. He recently sat down with us to discuss his life fighting Islamic extreme extremism from the inside. Here's the first part of that interview. So to give us some sense of the lengths you have to go to protect your life, tell us uh, what you went through to change your appearance. <laughs> uh, it was quite the process, actually. Um, I had to go to a uh, prosthetic uh, company who essentially has a chin, a nose, a forehead, a, um, new hair, uh, different skin coloring. It's, as you can tell, it's a little bit hard sometimes to move my mouth to properly enunciate, but at the end of the day, I'm sitting here looking like this, so it's a good thing. Yeah, no worse than Botox. <laughs> so, in your book, you describe how, com and I don't think you're bragging, it's, I think it's real, how completely fooled the extremists you lived among were by your cover. How did you convince them that you were one of them? Um, I, I study him. I mean, it's how do you make friends, Tucker, um, day to day, um, naturally, uh, the proper evolution of a relationship. Yes. You just try to inject yourself, create the proper persona, uh, we call it a legend, um, into that individual. But again, I get to cheat because I study their pattern of life, what they do what they don't do, what they eat, what they don't like to eat, where they go, where they, what they do. I jokingly say when they're not being jihadi, the right. human contact. Once I have that, um, it's, it's really not that hard to craft my legend to be able to insert myself into their lives, to be able what to are some of the age. What are some of the tells? I was struck in reading it how little, even those of us who kind of read the news every day, know about the people who commit or try to commit acts like this, what they're like personally, what they believe. What about them is different in the way that they live? Um, everything they do is extreme. Um, and that's, I guess, where the term extremism comes from. Yeah. So that's, in and of itself, doesn't make you a terrorist, but it's a red flag for me. It's multiple indicators, and that's what I tried to highlight in American Radical, is uh, it's not just for law enforcement and the intelligence community anymore to be able to know, to be able to distinguish between uh, a radical individual and a mainstream Muslim. I think it's imperative for us as a country to be able to defeat this enemy to actually have a better understanding of what makes them tick and there's multiple indicators one in and of itself doesn't make you a terrorist but when they all start to add up you want to look behind the curtain so what I mean the most obvious question what motivates them why are they angry enough at America that they want to kill Americans in some case lose their own lives complete and utter um, disregard for religion, but they take uh, what they feel is an interpretation of how to defend yourself. For example, the best way to describe it to you is Shahab's interpretation. Um, every major religious text, Tucker, has um, ways to defend yourself and so on and so right. forth, and sometimes those wording can obviously be um, harsh, for lack of a better term, but they take it and they would say, for example, that uh, Shahab says that every taxpayer in the United States is supporting a government that's occupying Muslim lands. And these governments are suppressing the proper military uh, that, so they can't defend themselves with a proper military force. So um, this is the only way to defeat them is with terrorism. Strike from within because they view it as a tool of war. It's an absolute desecration. It's not the proper interpretation of any religion, let alone Islam. So that is um, another indicator and yet a justification. Did you become close to these guys? How did you feel about them? Uh, I hate every one of them, obviously, but uh, my trick and um, others like me that do this um, is I latch on to something human in them. Yes. In Shahab's case, for example, here he is. He is a brilliant, world-renowned scientist on the precipice of curing infectious diseases. Um, he, 
what he offered to humanity uh, was so wonderful. The way he spoke to his mother, the way he supported his siblings financially. Those human parts of him is what I latch on to in order to, not, to at least be believable. So I didn't look at him with contempt and disgust every time we had a conversation or we traveled together. It's just so striking that a guy like that, who's not a loser, who's now in prison, but a guy like that would devote his life to killing Americans. It's just, that's not the profile uh, we've come to expect. And you know what, Tucker? That's one of the main reasons why I wrote this book is Shahab Asagayar's story, his radicalization. How do you go from mainstream on your way to being within two years, one step removed from Ayman al-Zawahiri, the leader of al-Qaeda. Yes. That fascinated me because of the fact that I work in counterterrorism, but I think um, it's a deep dive into that terrorist mindset that all Americans should understand uh, to answer all the questions that you're asking me now. Why do they hate us? How do they go from hello to oh my god? Up next, Brian Kilmeade of Fox and Friends is up late. He joins us in the friend zone to talk about Andrew Jackson, one of the most amazing American presidents. Stay tuned. the friend zone an irregular but beloved segment where we invite one of our friends from here at Fox onto the show Brian Kilmeade one of our all-time favorites hosts Fox and Friends by day early in the morning by night he's an expert on President Andrew Jackson he's got a new book on Old Hickory it's called Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans it's about the future president's massive triumph over the Brits in the War of 1812 often forgotten but celebrated in this book Brian Kilmeade joins us tonight Thanks so much for having me on. We well, love having you on. I can't believe you're still awake. On so, the gridiron. So I, I love the. I, I, love I the know. Graphics. I'm very impressed by it. So, this book has modern resonance in part because our current president has invoked Andrew Jackson so often. Do you see any similarities? Oh yeah. I mean, I took the same tour the president took with the same person the president went with, and you know, Andrew Jackson, uh, for one thing, was not liked by the establishment, the Virginia, Massachusetts establishment. Yeah. Andrew Jackson wasn't taken seriously when he ran. Andrew Jackson wasn't respected by his predecessors. Andrew Jackson liked to surround himself with his own family, once in the White House yes. in particular. And Andrew Jackson, most of all, has the same style, unique hair. Well, and he also, I think he literally shot a man on Fifth Avenue or in Nashville or something. <laughs> he did, did he, right? He got into an he argument. Shot. Shot yeah. Well, how yeah. else would you settle your scores? And that's what brings me to this. So Andrew Jackson was told as he was an orphan at 13. And to me, what I loved about this story, and I got into it even more than I thought I would, is because we are under the belief in America, and I know you believe this in all seriousness and all through our sarcasm, that it doesn't matter where you start in America, you have the opportunity to be successful, an opportunity to pursue happiness. He's at 13 years old, fighting in a war, loses his two older brothers, his dad died before he was born, and his mom goes to earn some money. He finds out his mom's dead because her stuff arrives in the house in a trunk. The guy never had a present, celebrated Christmas or a birthday. He was literally raised by his town. He was determined to matter, not to be a criminal, not to use that as an excuse. And he works his way up, becomes a lawyer, a congressman, a senator, a judge, an attorney general, a militia, uh, a militia general, wins the biggest battle maybe in American history, and then becomes a two-term president. That is an American story. And that it goes to show you whatever it takes, you can be successful, even back then before Twitter. He was a tough man. I mean, they called him an old hickory for a reason so quickly. The Battle of New Orleans, right. you're describing as the most important battle. You know they burned Washington to the yes, ground. Of you know the White House, it still exists. There's some burn marks in the, uh, in the archways there. They still have it. Uh, Tony Blair later apologized. I don't accept it. <laughs> so we lose that battle. We lose every other battle. Every city is terrorized, except Alexandria, who said, how much would it cost for you not to burn our city? And they wrote the check. So fantastic. So they get around, and all our generals are either underqualified or just shot because they're around since the revolution. We have not really had a standing army and militia. Retrospect, don't start a war, don't start a war with somebody, declare war on somebody if you are outnumbered three to one and the, uh, the army you're about to fight just beat Napoleon. Okay? Note to self. However, Major General Andrew Jackson wants revenge because he hates the British. They wiped out his family. He also bleeds red, white, and blue. He gets his militia of 1,400 and everywhere he goes, whether it's the Creek Indians or whether it's uh, the Spanish in Florida or whether it's the British down south, 
south, he takes them on and wins. But he knows the ultimate destination is to stop the Mississippi, get the Mississippi, and stop America from growing. They feared what we have, we, we have become, which are, is a superpower, an economic marvel, a democracy who rotates people and votes and gives people voice. If you're in the king and queen business, it's not great to see a democracy take root, right? Because <laughs> no, it's, it's oh, yeah, you don't usually win votes if you're a king. Elect me, I'll stay for a lifetime, even if I'm 12. Lovely system. So outnumbered two to one, outgunned, with an army put together in three weeks, we defeat the army, Wellington's Invincibles, that defeated Napoleon. We beat him in 45 minutes. And it's because of the leadership of Major General Andrew Jackson and the fearlessness of a truly American army put together with free people of color, Indians and pirates. You should be proud to be an American. There, this is your third book. They've sold huge numbers, and there's a reason why you just saw it. Brian Kilmeade, thank you. Thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank and to you. There's more. Before we get to Hannity, we'll be right back. That's it for us tonight and for the week. We'll be back Monday at 8, the show that's the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. Hope you have an absolutely terrific weekend. Good night from Washington. Sean Hannity is.